If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 11. I'm only going to read um, just one verse. Just one verse, and then uh, I'm going to actually come back to that. What I want to do this morning is share a little bit with you about Nehemiah. Uh, the things that he went through, some of the things that he went through, and then uh, on his way back to Jerusalem to build the wall. And then he's got a prayer right in the middle, and I want to share with you just a few things about his passion uh, that he had for the people. And then I want to try the difficult part, is to try to tie that in and apply it to the church today. All right? So if Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11, it's very, very short, and I'm not going to ask you to stand, and it just simply says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Lord, I'm grateful to be in a, a supercharged worship service where we have come to honor and praise you and give you thanks and give you glory. Lord, we're grateful for a choir, grateful for all that they do, grateful for a great congregation. Lord, those who have come to worship, those who are faithful each and every week to come and to be a part of what you have going on here at New Holland Baptist Church. Thank you, Father. I pray that you'll bless the message in a great and mighty way, for it's in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Let me say, first of all, that leaders... Great leaders care for people. Great leaders care for people. They care about the right things and they care in the right ways. Every leader, every leader has got his own or her own unique skills, talents, whatever it might be that he brings to a situation or a circumstance. But one trait that I noticed that most leaders have is the one that, one that they are attentive. Their attentiveness. Uh, they pay attention to uh, the people that they're leading. How many times have you heard Brother Brian stand up here and say, he is attentive. He wants to hear. He wants to stay in touch with the congregation and listen to what they have to say and go uh, do the things that they, they would like to do. Uh, we see that there are many characters in the Bible that care. Abraham cared and rescued Lot from Sodom. Moses cared and delivered the nation of Israel from Egypt. David cared and brought the nation and the kingdom back to the Lord. You all remember Esther? Esther cared and risked her own life um, to save her nation from genocide. Paul risked his life as he took the gospel throughout the Roman Empire, and finally, Jesus himself cared so much for all of us that he left his home in heaven, he came and walked among men, died on the cross, so that you and I uh, could have eternal life, that we would no longer be slaves to sin, but we would be free from that sin. Nehemiah is one of those people, he was that type of a person who cared. He cared about the traditions of the past, he cared about the needs of the present, and he cared about the hope of the future. He also cared about his heritage, he cared about his ancestral city, and he, cared about, he cared about the glory of his God. He cared enough to Notice an opportunity when it presented itself as the wall in the city of Jerusalem needed to be uh, rebuilt, where others saw it just as an impossibility. Maybe most of all, he cared enough to make himself available to make sure that the job or the mighty task got done. God is still today, God is still looking for people like Nehemiah who care enough about the task to ask for the facts, to weep over the needs, to pray for God's help, and to make themselves available to get the job done. Now, I want to take, we're going to start in Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1, 
And I'm almost going to have to read quite a bit of it, but just stick with me. Uh, chapter 2, not so much, okay? So let's start with um, Nehemiah chapter 1 in verse 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. It came to pass in the month of Cheslev, in the 20th year, as I was in Sushan, the citadel. Well, first of all, we need to understand that Nehemiah wasn't a pastor. He wasn't an evangelist. He wasn't a preacher. He was a layperson. He was a layperson that ended up being the cupbearer for the king, King Artaxerxes. And we see that Nehemiah identified himself. He's the one that's actually doing the writing here. Nehemiah identified himself as the son of Hekeliah. And the reason he did that is because evidently there were many in and around where he was that had the name Nehemiah, and he wanted to distinguish himself from everybody else. He wanted to know who he was and who was writing um, this particular book. We see that the word, the name Nehemiah simply means the Lord has comforted. We see that Nehemiah is here in Sushan. A lot of people will end up calling it Susa. So whichever name you want to use is just fine. But listen, Nehemiah wasn't in Sushan by happenstance. It wasn't an accident. God had put Nehemiah in this particular location, just as he had put Esther in this same location almost a generation before. And just as he had put Joseph in Egypt, and just as he had put Daniel in Babylon. Here's one thing for sure. When God is prepared, when God is ready to do a task, when God is ready to do a work, He always prepares. He always prepares His workers and he always puts them in the right place at the right time. We see that it came to pass that in the month of Cheslev, which is actually the month, it's the, actually the ninth month on the Jewish calendar. It's actually the month of, um, that it's really between November and December, the ninth month in the Jewish calendar. So that's the time frame, or that's the particular time that we were at. And while, um, Nehemiah was there, there were some brethren that came back from Jerusalem. And you have to understand that Nehemiah had not been in Jerusalem or Judah for quite some time. So when he saw the brethren coming back, and the group was headed up by Hanani, he, he went, Nehemiah went to them and he questioned. He wanted to know how things were going. How things were going in Jerusalem. And he had two concerns, and we see that in verse 2. It said, Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. So his two questions, his two concerns were about the Jews that were still in Jerusalem, want to know how they were doing and how the city was. Well, he was kind of taken back when Hannah and I gave him the explanation. It was an explanation that he wasn't prepared for. And I simply brought, brought the report to Nehemiah, and he said, And they said to me, The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and, repro and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Nehemiah asked about Jerusalem and the people there because he had a caring heart. He cared about the people that were there. And when you truly care about people, you know what? You want to know the truth. You want to know the facts. Example, I don't want to be in the hospital and, and have a terminal illness and a doctor tells me, well, we, we think that over a period of time, you're going to get better. Just tell me the truth. If I've got a month to go, I've got a month to go. If I've got two years, I've got two years. You know, just tell me the truth. I want the facts of what you found. That's what I'm relying on you for. That's what I'm paying you for. We see that as they gave Nehemiah this report, there's really three words that come to mind uh, as we describe the condition um, 
of Jerusalem. And that first word is remnant, and then ruin, and then reproach. We see that instead of a land that was inhabited by a great nation, only a remnant of people were left there. Just a very few. And the ones that were there were struggling. There was great affliction. It was all they could do to survive. Maybe not much food, maybe not much water, but it was a a challenge for them each and every day to survive in those conditions. And then we see that ruin, talk about ruin, instead of being the magnificent city that Jerusalem was, it was in shambles. It was ruined. Homes, buildings had been torn down. The gates were torn down. The gates had been burned. And it was dire need of repair. We see where there was once been great glory. Now there was great reproach. Great reproach. So Nehemiah says in verse 4, he says, So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah fasted as he mourned. Now, fasting wasn't required as an everyday thing. Fasting was required by the Jews once a year on the annual day of atonement. But Nehemiah, he sort of went over the top because he was praying, he was mourning, he was fasting each and every day, and he knew that somebody, somewhere, somehow, was going to have to go to Judah, to Jerusalem, and patch it up, fix it up, and rebuild it. And we see that he came to this moment of prayer. This moment of prayer. And it's interesting that he had this prayer. And as I got to reading this particular prayer, we see that uh, I I know there's five things. And I'm not trying to tell people how to pray. This is how I do it. This This is a Rick thing, okay? But there's actually five things within this prayer that are available to us today that we see And if you want to use those, you can. If not, you know, I'm sure you might have your own way. But let me read this prayer, and then we'll go over the five things, okay? Right quick. Starting in verse 5, in Nehemiah chapter 1, this is Nehemiah speaking again. He said, And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house, and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of heavens of the heavens yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling place for my name now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand o oh lord i pray please let me let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servant who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Five things that I want to touch on quickly that we can use, and Nehemiah actually used them here. In the first one, when I start, start praying, take my quiet time, always start with praise. 
Always start with praise. And Nehemiah did the same thing here when he said, Lord of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe the commandments. He's talking about what a great way when we wake up in the morning, first thing before we ever roll out of bed, just praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him for all creatures here below. Folks, we have so many things. We ought to praise God each and every moment of the day. we got so many things to be thankful for. I know I am thankful personally for my own salvation, that God saved me almost 47 years ago. He saved me, and I am grateful for that. I, if for nothing else, I can praise Him for that. We see you not only praise, you start off with that, but then probably the one that I don't like too much Probably nobody else does either, and that's confession. Lord, I have to admit, this, that, whatever it might be, and Lord, you know I'm not perfect, but I confess I want to be humble before you. You already know what I've done. You're aware of that, but I'm just letting you know that I know that you know what I've done. So, so we have to have that confession in that prayer time. And then we see that there's petition. There's petition. And he, if we look, I think it's in verse 6, he simply says, uh, let your ears be attentive. He is petitioning the Lord. Lord, please hear my prayer. Please hear my prayer. You know, God hears our prayers. All the prayers. Now, he might not respond the way we think that he ought to. He may not respond when we think he ought to, but he hears our prayers. So we have petition where we bring our request to him. And finally, the fourth one is intercession, where we're actually praying for other people. Other people, other needs, and I'm sure people ask you all the time, pray for me for this. Pray for me. You might have a spiritual need. You might have a physical need. You might have uh, a financial need. People want you to pray for them. They ask you to pray. Not just one time. Not just one time. We need to pray for people until there's a breakthrough in their lives. Keep praying and praying and praying. Now, there, I said there was five steps to this or five categories. And there's only four here. There's only four here, so I want you to turn with me right quickly to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, and I want to look at verses 18 and 19. We're all familiar with this. Exodus 14, verses, did I say 18 and 19? It should be 19 and 20, I'm sorry, 19 and 20. We're all familiar with this particular verse, this particular situation that Moses is now leading the nation of Israel from Egypt headed toward the promised land. And Pharaoh has understood, or he knows now that he's made a great mistake in letting them go, so he is chasing after them. He's chasing after them, and he comes. To, they come to the Red Sea. And Israel has got nowhere to go. They got the sea in front of them, and Pharaoh's coming up behind them. Pharaoh's desire is to run the entire nation of Israel into the Red Sea and exterminate them. Let me tell you, as a matter of history, those people who desire to extinguish or exterminate the entire Jewish nation doesn't work out. It never has worked out. It's not going to work out. I think in the book of Esther... When uh, Haman is wanting to execute and to terminate the entire Jewish nation, and what happens? God turns the tables, and it's actually Haman, not Mordecai, who is hung. We think about earlier stages, we think about during World War II. Hitler, his desire was to take and remove the nation of Israel. That didn't work out well for him either. A word to the wise for the nation of Iran who wants to wipe the nation of Israel off the face of the earth. It's not going to happen. Israel, or Israel, 
Iran is treading on thin ice, and you all know what happens when you tread on thin ice. Eventually, you're going to fall through. Verse 19, this is amazing. The fifth step in the prayer thing is meditation. Meditation, all right? As I read this, I want to share what it's like because there's a difference between reading God's Word and meditating and dwelling on God's Word. Verse says, And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp and the Egyptians, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that one did not come close to the other all night long. Now that may not say a whole lot to you, just just reading it, just taking it face value. I was reading this one day, and just kind of, it was no, didn't stand out any more than any other verse. But then I got to dwell on it. The meditation is a good time for me because prayer time is a conversation. And up to the point of meditation, guess who's been doing all the talking? So God says that, okay, it's time for the meditation. I'm doing the talking. He starts to, he starts to talk to her, he lays things on our hearts. In these two particular verses, plain verses, nothing really stands out. You realize that at the crossing of the Red Sea, that God, God had you on his mind. Way back, and people say, well, I wasn't even around by that. That's okay. The God we serve knows who's going to be born two million years from now. He knows all about it. He knew all about you even at the crossing of the Red Sea. And people say, well, how could that be? How could that be? Well, think about it. Nea, um, Pharaoh, get my name straight, Pharaoh, was wanting to run all the nation into the Red Sea. So, being Jewish, if, they, if he had his way and he moved and all the people were running into the Red Sea, guess what? There's no more Jews. Well, if there's no more Jews, how is it that Jesus would have got here? If there's no Jews. The wise people will say, well, God would have figured out a different way. No, 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 no. God only has plan A. He implements that and he makes it work. So if there were no Jews and there was no Jesus, there's no gospel, there's no ministry, there's no Jesus on the cross, there's no death on the cross, there's no tomb, there's no grave. And guess what? Three days later, there's no resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, where does that leave you and me? We're in trouble. We are in trouble. Listen, uh, you know, so think about reading your Bible, meditating. When you think about it, and let God... Speak to your heart. You know, he's got a lot to say. He's got a lot to say to it. Real prayer keeps, our, keeps your heart and your head balanced so that your burden doesn't um, make you impatient and have a desire to run ahead. To run ahead. And you know what? We have to be patient. We have to be patient with the Lord. We have to wait on Him. Because if we're patient and we wait, he's going to tell us how to do it. He's going to tell us when to do it. And he's going to tell us where to do it. How to do it, when to do it, or what it is that we need to do. Amazing, amazing. So, you know, at the time of the prayer, I don't believe that... Um, Nehemiah knew exactly what God had in store for him, but he was going to take time to do that. And we see that starting in chapter 2, 
that Nehemiah had actually been in prayer and mourning and fasting for four months. And it had been four months since he received the bad news from the brothers from Jerusalem. And Nehemiah had patiently waited on the Lord for those three months, four months, for direction, for direction. And that's important because, you know, when we wait on the Lord for direction, uh, it's through faith and patience that um, we inherit the promises. And when you take time to pray and wait on the Lord, you're not wasting your time. You're investing your time. You're investing your time in the Lord. And God is preparing. God is preparing us, preparing. He works through the circumstances. Um, and so Nehemiah now, in chapter 2, has to come before the king. Has to come before the king in a different light, though. In a different light. He saw the king every day. But now he was having to come before the king because he was asking something of the king. You think about it. How about your boss? You see your boss every day, do you not? Every day. Just imagine that you have your company has an audit tomorrow and you have to call them today and say, well, you know, I really need to be off tomorrow. And imagine the look that you're going to get and might raise an eyebrow. He doesn't want you to be off. So that's the kind of situation that Nehemiah was in. He had to come before the king and ask him, God wants to send him back to Jerusalem for the rebuilding, and he ended up seeing that he had to do that. He had to come before the king because he couldn't leave his post without the king's permission, and he couldn't do any kind of the work in Jerusalem without the king's permission. He had to have papers signed by the king that would allow him to travel through the territories in order to get to Jerusalem. And that wasn't a short trip. The distance between Sushan and Jerusalem is about 800 miles. That's like walking from here to Dallas, Texas. Think how long it would take. Just do the math right quick. If you walk two miles an hour, eight hours a day, that's 16 miles a day, times 50 days is 800 miles. Quite a, quite a ways. Quite a ways. So we see that he ended up, he approached the king, not saying, oh, well, I, uh, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, this is my plan for this. He put him in kind of, he played on the king's sympathy here. He said, now, you know, can you imagine, king, what it would be like if your homeland had been wiped out, the city had been burned, the people, the only ones, it was a remnant of the people there. Your homeland was gone. And you have a desire to go back. How would you feel? How would you feel? Well, the, the king granted him permission. Granted him permission to go. And that's where we come to the verse that we read in Nehemiah 2.11. It says, so I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Well, once he got there three, for those three days, there's two things that, that Nehemiah had to do. First of all, he had to make an honest evaluation, assessment of what needed to be done. He saw that the gates had been burned. He saw that um, the city was in shambles. But he also had to identify the needs. He had to identify the needs. He needed material to rebuild the city, but he also needed people. He needed people to get the work done. So as we look back, we've talked about Nehemiah, what he'd gone through. We talked about his prayer, where he's at. Now he is in Jerusalem. And what I want to try to do in the next few minutes is tie this in to the church. Okay? So we want to look at the purpose of the work. Nehemiah faced a great challenge. And he had great faith in a great God. But you know what? He would have accomplished very, very little if there had not been great dedication on, par, on the part of the people who helped build the wall. He had to count on the people. You know, and with the kind of humility that befits a godly leader, you know, Nehemiah gave all the credit to the people. 
didn't take any credit for himself. He gave it all to the people. It's like the church today. Today we look at the church, as, to me it's like riding a bicycle. You have the leaders in the church at the handlebars. They're actually steering. Okay, They're determining what direction we need to go. But folks, it's the church. It's the lay people. It's the everyday, common, ordinary folk that is pedaling the bicycle that makes the church go. And if the church is not going to pedal the bicycle and move forward, guess what? You don't need the leaders. You don't need pastors. You don't need deacons. You don't need trustees or any of that. Because you ever try to sit on a bicycle without pedaling? It falls over. It falls over. We see that as he gave credit to the people, Nehemiah said, at last the wall has completed it to, to half its height around the entire city for the people had worked with enthusiasm. So we see that it included all the people, all the people that had to go to work. Everybody had a job to do. Look at the pattern of the work right quick. 38 individual workers are named in this chapter and 42 different groups are identified. But there's still some, some that are nameless that didn't get named. Didn't get named whose labors and their work was also uh, important. Whether they're named or they're anonymous, they were assigned a task to work and a task and a place to be. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14, Paul tells us that, or compares individual Christians to members of the human body. Each member of the body is important, and each one performs a special function. You know what? We can't all, we look for jobs and things to do in the church. We can't all be a hand. We can't all be a foot. We can't all be an eye. But there, we need to find something to do for the Lord. Think about this. Even though there are a limited amount of jobs in the church, once we walk through those doors right there and we get outside the, the four walls of the church, the jobs are endless. They're endless. And we see that we need to be working in the community. We need to be building relationships. We need to be building and promoting the church. Think about this. How many saw the ball game last night? How many dog fans we have? Few? Okay. Think about this. Most people agree that Georgia's got a pretty good football program, probably one of the elite. Let me ask you this. Do you think that they built that elite program by Kirby Smart sitting in a chair in his office waiting for those five-star athletes and those four-star athletes to knock on his door and say, well, Coach Smart, I heard you had a great program here, and I'd like to play football at Georgia. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think so. They have got recruiters that go out to see the players, to see their families. They're building relationships convincing the parents that they have their child's best interest at heart. And the church is no, is no different. If we're waiting, if we're waiting for people to knock on that door, to knock on that door, wanting to come in because they heard New Holland Baptist Church is a great church, it's not going to happen. We have to go outside. We have to go outside the four walls, build relationships, talk to people, who are lost, share the gospel message with people that we come in contact with. Two things I've seen that as I look at churches, today I see that the church, the American church, has become introverted. We are introverted. We are more concerned about what's going on inside these four walls than we are about what's going on outside the four walls and being in the church. Now, I understand it's a priority. Even here, we're talking about the sanctuary and this, that, whatever. Those are priorities. They are. They need to be done. But I don't think it's the top priority. The top priority is to be outside the four walls of the church, being with the people, convincing them that 
they need to come to New Holland Baptist Church. But you know what? It can't be done by just the pastors. It can't be done by just the deacons. It needs to be done by the whole church. The witnessing, tell people what Jesus has done for you. Second thing I see with the church today in the American church is that we see a... You know, hold your seat, put your seatbelt on when I say this. See a infiltration in the church of a new salvation. You heard me right, a new salvation. And that salvation takes on this look. People come in and they say, I'm a follower of Christ. I know Jesus. I've been saved. But you examine their life and you see that there's no confession. There's no repentance. And there's no change. I can only speak for myself. I can't speak for you. That's not the kind of salvation that I know. That's not the kind of salvation I'm familiar with. All of us, if we are truly saved, Jesus has touched our lives and He's changed us. We are. We are different. We need to confess our sins. We need to confess our sins before the Lord. So what is it that you can do for the church? Remember on January, I can say I remember, I was small. Remember on January 20th, 1960, JFK was making his inaugural speech. And he had these words to say, and you all are familiar with them. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. I would change that up and modify that today. And simply say, ask not what your church can do for you. Ask what you can do for your church. Folks, there's plenty of jobs, plenty to do. I'd say, what is it that God is calling you to do today? What is He calling you to do?